Okay, welcome uh, to the New Year's event of the Geo, uh, Geotop A web seminar. So the inaugural lecture by uh, Professor Tudor Rathew. And uh, it's a great uh, honor and privilege to have with us one of the greatest experts on, uh, on uh, geometric mechanics uh, or analytical mechanics as it was called when we were younger. Anyway, he will give a talk on geometry of uh, fluid dynamics. So thank you very much, Tudor, to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to be able to address you. And I hope that this is going to interest you. Uh, I want to give you some kind of, it's not exactly a survey, but uh, it has also new parts uh, about geometric fluid dynamics. And what I will do is I will try to stick historically correct just to the Lagrangian side, which some of you who know me probably are surprised because I usually do the symplectic or Poisson or Dirac uh, approach. But uh, historically, this is how it happened. Lagrange did it like this. Arnold did it like this in 66, in 1970, Eben Marsden. So I'm going to stick with this. And it's also cutting through a lot of things and I can get faster to some results. So uh, I'm going to start just standard classical mechanics. So I'm giving you a Lagrangian, which is a function on the tangent bundle of a configuration manifold, which I call Q. I give you the action, which is the integral of the Lagrangian. Of course, I write it so that you can remember there is a QT and a Q dot T, but actually I don't need to write Q of T because I'm, I'm on a manifold. It's, I don't have two variables. And this is defined on the space of paths with fixed endpoints. Now I'm going to call it the formation. If I have a family of such curves and the variation is the derivative at uh, the parameter equal to zero, this d d epsilon at epsilon equal to zero of this deformation family. And I denote it like physicists denote it by delta, delta Q. So let me, re let me remind you of the classical Hamilton principle. And I'm going to state it in a little, in a slightly different form. You may not be totally familiar with this. So uh, this is the usual way. What is delta S means d the epsilon of Q of the path, which is a point in this infinite dimensional space by epsilon. And the, you get this, either Lagrange equations which are second order. Now, I wrote the equations in components and immediately you say, well, what do, what do you mean? Uh, is this, isn't this intrinsic? Yes, it is. And it's absolutely amazing that this in fact, in some sense was known to Lagrange. It's hard to put my finger on it to say exactly how much is Lagrange and how much is modern mathematics, but certainly the ideas were in Lagrange. And this was, also amazingly, when he was already 73 years old when he did this. So here is the situation. I give you a CK Lagrangian, again on the tangent bundle of a configuration manifold, and then the theorem states that there exists a unique CK minus two fiber bundle map from, or covering the identity on Q from the second order submanifold. I will explain this more in more detail in the next slide, but think of it as second derivatives of curves. That, this is what I wrote here, just second derivative of curves with values in the cotangent bundle. And in addition to that, there exists a CK minus one, one form on TQ, which I denote by theta L, such that for any deformations, the C2 so that I can take two derivatives, Q epsilon of T on a given interval, where Q0 is the curve Q of T, we have the following thing. DS of Q on delta Q is the integral from T0 to T1 of this operator applied to the second derivative in the direction of the variation delta Q plus theta L on, again, some variations between T0 and T1. So who are these variations? The first one you already saw before is just dd epsilon of q epsilon of t. And the other one is just dd epsilon at epsilon equal to zero of the time derivative of that. Okay. So this one form is called the Lagrange one form. Uh, 
notice that I'm using zero symplectic geometry here. Of course, it is all the same. I'm going to mention to you at the end. So let me be very precise what I mean by this. So if I give you two curves on a little interval containing zero, I'm going to say that they're K equivalent if they go through the same point and all the derivatives up to, to K coincide in, in a chart and then it turns out it's intrinsic, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is, is global and you get a bundle that goes from the case or the tangent to T0 is uh, Q, T1 is the tangent bundle, is the only vector bundle in this list. The other ones are not. They're in fact the jet bundles. Now, depending on what kind of formalism you are used to, this TK coincides with the fiber bundle of jets from R into Q. The occasions occur so that if you don't know this, you don't. What I told you is exactly, if you know this formalist, I'm not inventing anything extra. It's, these are objects that are very well known. And of course, in coordinates, what you get is exactly the euler lagrange proper. Now, by the right? So what you put computer, So this is an object in the second order tangent bundle. And that's the answer. This is exactly what it means globally. Now, I deliberately stick on the Lagrangian side. If you want it on the Hamiltonian side, it's very simple. You have the Legendre transformation. You have the PQ dot minus L transformation to the Hamiltonian. And uh, you pull back by Legendre transformation to one form. And the theta L that defined that I gave you via the variational principle, in fact, is the pullback of the canonical one form on the cotangent bundle. These are all little theorems. They're not that difficult. Okay. The question is, what happens if you have symmetries? So, there is, I want to point out immediately that there is a serious problem. So, if you have symmetries, of course, you can drop to the quotient. Assume all the good conditions, proper actions, free actions, whatever you want, so that this is the manifold. Uh, singularities are another story. And some of it is known, some of it is still not understood. But even here, it's a problem. So this is not a tangent bundle. When you do reduction in symplectic geometry, you start with symplectic manifolds, you end symplectic, Poisson and Poisson, Dirac, you end Dirac. This time, I don't. I end up with something else. Now, if I have a principal connection, which I call by A on the bundle Q over Q mod G, there is a direct sum. This goes under some names. Some people call it the Atiyah sequence. So there is a connection dependent isomorphism of bundles, of vector bundles with base Q mod G that gives you that this quotient here is the direct sum, the witness sum of the tangent bundle of Q mod G plus the adjoint bundle. The adjoint bundle is a bundle of a Q mod G whose fibers are Lie algebras, the Lie algebra G. Okay, so there are answers to this. And in fact, what you should really do with Lagrange's equations, you should work not on tangent bundles, but on tangent bundles plus a vector bundle with certain structures but I'm not going to go in there. I mean, this is all explained in this old paper. I'm going to take a very simple case, Q equal to G. If Q equal to G, this is a point, and this is a Lie algebra. And this is TG over G, and this is just the Lie algebra because it's trivialized. My notation is simply like this, at C is take the bracket, and at star C, is the dual map. Whenever I put a star, I really mean dual, and I don't understand minus signs or minus ones as some books do. If there is a minus sign or a minus one, I'll, I will put it. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you one of the main tools that is the Euler-Poincaré reduction process. 
and is due to a paper of Poincaré in 1901. If you want to see an English translation of this, it is in the, in the volume, in, I think the first or second volume of uh, Daryl Holmes' course. It's an absolutely remarkable paper. Uh, what, he, what Poincaré does, he simply says, this is so interesting that I want to tell you about. This is literally what he says. I discovered this. He doesn't quote anything. He doesn't say why he does it. He doesn't do it. He never worked on it before, never worked on it afterwards. So here's what Poincaré does. Of course, he works on SO3 because he wanted to understand the rigid body. But all you have to do is you have to replace SO3 by G and just do what Poincaré did. So here's what he does. He takes a Lagrangian which is either left or right invariant. And then he takes the derivative of a curve and brings it to the identity, either left or right. And then four things are equivalent. The Euler-Lagrange equations hold. Hamilton's variational principle holds. Nothing new. I just stated the theorem a moment ago. So it has nothing to do with Poincaré. But now comes Poincaré and he says, the equa these equations hold, which today we call the Euler Poincare equations, is DDT del L del C is equal to plus for left minus for right, at star C del L del C. And the Euler Poincare variational principle holds, which is a variational principle on L on one variable, not on two variables anymore, on half the variables. But there is a catch. And the catch is that it is constrained. And the constraint is given by delta C equal to eta dot plus minus C eta, where eta t is an arbitrary path that vanishes at the endpoints. So let's try to prove this and let's see where the problem is. One is equivalent to two that has nothing to do with Poincaré. That is classical analytical mechanics. Let's prove that three is equivalent to four. This is so easy that we can do it in our head. Look here. Let's do it. I take integral from t0 to t, you get del L del C delta C. Plug in delta C, you get eta dot plus minus C eta, right? C eta is at C eta. Take it on the other side, you get at star C, and the, take the dot and put it on the other side. Integrate by parts. What you get is this minus this times eta. Therefore, if the equations hold, this is zero. And conversely, if this is zero for any eta, vanishing at the endpoints, exactly like in classical calculus of variations, the other factor has to be zero, which are these equations. Okay, so one, two are equivalent, three, four are equivalent. How about like this? Well, this also is almost there. Look here. I'm going to show you that two and four, I'm going to attempt to show you that two and four are equivalent. Well, not the variational principle are equal. Not even the action is equal. The integrands are equal. They couldn't be more equal than that. Why? Because L is invariant under the group action. So I can multiply by G minus one here and by G minus one there. Well, G minus one G is the identity. I'm not stupid to write it. And I have psi T G minus one G dot. This is exactly what I wrote here. So what is the content of the, of the theorem? The content of the theorem is exactly here. And if this reminds you of formulas that you see in differential geometry having to do with covariant derivatives and normal derivatives and torsion, etc. You are on the right track. So I'm going to prove for you this lemma. Now, if you want to work with uh, matrix groups, it's very easy. You just compute. But I'm going to give you an abstract proof that shows you the geometric structure. So here it is. I give you a family with two variables. I had T and Epsilon here, now I have T and S. I'm totally democratic about among them. I don't prefer one or the other. It's a smooth map. And I'm going to work on the right because for fluids, everything is on the right. So what is Xi of T? You take the derivative relative to T for every S and then bring it to the identity. And you do the same thing for eta, but this time with S and then bring it to the identity. The statement is, the DDS of Xi 
minus dd t eta of t is minus xi eta, which is exactly what I said here, right? As a minus. Delta xi is dd epsilon of xi. Here is xi, g epsilon minus one, g dot. Eta dot, you take first the dd epsilon. I'm telling you, this is, you ask me, who is this eta? This is the eta. You take dd epsilon, and epsilon equal to zero, and then you take the ddt. It is exactly this lemma. So how do you prove it? It's very easy. You, if you have a Lie group, you have you have the maurer cartan forms. So let me take the right one because I work on the right for fluids. You take a vector and bring it back by right translation to the identity. You get a Lie algebra valued one form. And the maurer cartan structure equations say that d rho minus one half, the wedge product going with the bracket is equal to zero. What does this mean? Some people write row wedge row, some people write row bracket row. Wherever you have a bilinear map like this, you can associate a wedge product. And I wrote it here in all its glory details. What is, does it mean? It, it is exactly this. A, a first form on the first vector, second form on the second, minus the other way around. Except that this time it's not multiplication. It is the bracket, so it changes sign, so you get a half, you get a two, and that's where the half comes from. Okay, so here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this row and pull it back by G to this open rectangle. Okay, so let's do it. Well, this is a open rectangle, it's two-dimensional manifold, it has a basis, global basis formed of two vector fields. So at a given time, T is this. So I pull back, this, uh, this is the definition of pullback. And this one is the definition of partial derivative. And the row is just minus one. So pullback gives you Xi. Well, the same thing is gonna happen with eta. Therefore, G star rho is Xi dt plus eta ds, because that's what I computed. Consequently, seen by the structure equations, this is zero. So if I pull back, I still get zero. Okay, so I, I write it out, what it is. I compute the pullback, and now I plug in. This formula, I plug it in here, plug it in here, and plug it in here. And completely stupid computation gives you the answer. So this is the full proof of the Euler, of the Euler-Poincaré equation. Now, the question is, can you do it on the other side? For those of you who know Poisson geometry, the answer is yes. This is equivalent if the Legendre transformation, the reduced one, is a diffeomorphism to the Lee Poisson equations, which are written here. But I'm not going to use them. Just for those of you who know, I haven't done anything out of the ordinary. The question is, if you solve the Euler Poincare equations, have you solved your original problem? The answer is yes up to quadrature. So here is the method. It's completely algorithmic. You take your Lagrange and then restrict to the tangents to the identity. That's no big deal. You write the Euler-Poincaré equations left or right, and you solve them. If it's an integrable system, well, use whatever method, algebraic geometry, for example. If it's not, use numerics. And how do you do it? But via variational integrators. That's an industry today. There are people making, earning their life out of this. So th there is a huge amount known here. So you solve it in, in some shape or form. What do you do next? Once you, knew, once you know Xi of T, you solve a linear equation with time dependent coefficient. A physicist would call time ordered exponential. Here it's on the left, here it's on the right. Once you're done, here is the formula. This is the solution of the Euler Lagrange equation. G0, G of T, Xi of T. How do you find it? You take the initial condition, you look at the point where it's based, you compute, bring it back to the identity, have the Xi zero. This is your initial condition here, right? And now you write the formula, done. This is it, I solved the problem. This is the miracle of reduction. You, I have cut the variables in half. Okay, let's go to continuum mechanics because I want to do fluids. So there is a reference configuration. I call it B from body. 
and G is a Riemannian metric and it's usually oriented. So usually B is some, something in R3 and I call all these, all the elements with big letters. Then there is another manifold, which I call space S and G. Also oriented Riemannian, again, usually S is just the whole space. And these letters are small letters. And the configuration is an orientation preserving embedding from B into S. So the configuration space is embeddings that are orientation preserving from the manifold B to the manifold S. What is a motion? Time dependent family of configurations. So now there is, you can do something else. You can take this motion and take this basis E1, E2, E3 and move it with the body. This is, these are called the body or the convected coordinates. Here is the picture. Somewhere out there, not in our world, is this B. This is our world, the space. This is the frame in space, the little e's, and the xi's are a frame fixing the body that move together with the body. So your problem in continuing mechanics is to write whatever phenomenon you see, equations of motion, whatever you want. You have to write it in three ways. You don't understand the problem till you don't understand it and you don't write it in three ways. And this is not an easy order. This is quite a tall order in many cases. So let me start. I need the velocity. So what do I do? I take the derivative of the motion. Problem, this is not a vector field. This is a vector field covering phi of t. But I can make it into a vector field. How do I make it into a vector field? I write the material velocity or Lagrangian velocity as a function of the spatial variable. This means concretely, this index t is not partial derivative, it's freeze t. Vt composed with phi t is Vt. This is a vector field, but I can also do it the other way around. I can think of the material point as a function of the spatial point. By convention, I put a minus because I don't want to carry too many minuses with me. And you can see immediately why, because I have to take the derivative of an inverse and I don't want to carry too many minuses. I want the minus to go away. So this is the convective velocity. This is also a vector field. So I haven't even started the problem and I have huge symmetry groups. My configuration space is embeddings. The diffeomorphism of the body acts on the right. And the material frame indifference group, which is a diffeomorphism of space, acts on the left. So, I mean, you say you don't have, you don't have symmetry. Symmetry comes out of your ears. Yeah, I haven't even looked for it. And it's there facing me in infinite dimensions. Okay. Now comes the first big leap. I'm going to jump. I'm going to give you a vast generalization of the Euler-Poincaré method. I want to introduce, I want to be able to work with fluids or continua that have advected quantities and internal structure all at the same time. Internal structure are liquid crystals, for example. Fluids don't have internal structure unless you have certain special fluids. Okay, so what do I need? I need things that encode the advected quantities. So this turns out to be representations. So here is my notation. I start with the right representation and I let the group, I write, I write everything on the right. G acts on V on the right. This is the action on the dual. This is the induced Lie algebra representation. And this is the representation on the dual of the Lie algebra. And there are duality pairings, G star and G and V star and V. And I denote them in this fashion. My duals are not going to be strictly speaking, literally duals, as you will see. But this is coming later to bite me. You are not going to see this when you start doing analysis. You have to worry about this. Okay, so you have an affine right. In addition to that, you have an affine right representation. That means I have a representation on the dual and I add some function that depends on the group. Now, if you want this to be an action, 
and a certain identity is being forced on C. This identity looks like this. An algebra is immediately recognizes this. This is a group one co-cycle. So therefore I have an infinitesimal action associated to this. And in order not to carry too much notation, I call this tangent map at the identity on C just by DC. Now I have to compute the transposes. So I compute them. Formulas are not important at this, at this level. What is important for you to know is that I can compute. Uh, these are not theorems that there exists. I need to compute, I need equations. And here is one operation that I really need. It's called the diamond operation. And here is what it does. It associates to a vector and the covector, an element in the dual of the Lie algebra. How does it do it? I as associate a xi to this v diamond a, and this is the following. I let xi act on the dual element a, and then I pair it with v. Now, if you uh, if you have uh, a uh, how, how should I say? If you know enough symplectic geometry, this is completely obvious. This is the momentum map of the lifted action to the cotangent bundle of V. V is a vector space, so it's just V cross V star. But if you don't know this, it doesn't matter. The point, the only point I'm making is it's computable. I have a formula. Now I have to tell you that I'm taking a semi-direct product. And since semi-direct products, there are 16 equivalent definitions. I tell you what my conventions are. These are my conventions. The bracket is computed in this fashion. Again, remember, G2 acts on V1, C2 acts on V1. And because I'm going to do either Poincaré, I need to compute the co-adjoint action, and I compute it. And here it is. I have a concrete formula, absolutely concrete formula. So in a physical problem, in which I have vectored quantities and internal symmetries, what, what am I given? I'm given a Lagrangian that depends on parameters, mass, entropy, magnetic field, whatever, right? If this would be the rigid body, this would be the gravitational acceleration, the value of the gravitational acceleration, for example. And I assume that this Lagrangian is invariant under a certain action, and I give you the action. Again, you say, where did you fish this action? Let me not go through this. It, it's a natural action. It, it, it doesn't come from a nightmare. Right? It, it's completely natural. So if I were to freeze all parameters, then I would be in the classical situation. I just have a Lagrangian that depends on some parameters, like initial mass, initial conditions in mass and entropy in magnetic field, right? On the tangent bundle of a configuration space, which is given just by freezing it. And then you have to have then symmetry is broken. It's not invariant under the full group, it's invariant under the a certain isotropy group that depends also on the cycle. Now, uh, I want you to notice that if, if C is, is really there and A0 zero is zero, this is not the whole group. If C is not there, then G0 is of course G. But if there is a cycle, it's not. Anyway. Right invariance allows me to do this. In other words, if I have little l, I can define capital L. And if I have capital L, I have little l. And now I go do exactly like Poincaré did. I take psi of t, I write it, take a curve, bring it to the identity. And I take my initial parameters and I let the affine action act on it. Now, if you take the DDT of that, you are going to get a differential equation. And this is the differential equation. So in, in fact, what I'm telling you is that I have a differential equation with this initial condition, and here is the solution. But of course, the solution involves G, which I don't know yet. So this is all coupled. It's all very nice in principle. So the point is that I have the same, the same story as in Euler-Poincaré. So with A0 fixed, I have the classical Hamilton variational principle. 
and of course, this is equivalent to satisfying the euler lagrange equations for all for this L depending on all these parameters. But now it's getting interesting. The constraint variational principle holds. Notice that now my A suddenly has become dynamic. Think of the density in material configuration and the density in spatial configuration of the fluid. In spatial configuration, the density moves. It's time dependent. I'm coming back to this in a second. So I have this and you recognize the formula that I have given you before for Xi and there is an analogous formula for variations of the parameter, which involves the co-cycle if it's there and the contragradient representation of the Lie algebra. And you have other Poincaré equations, here they are. Notice that if I cut off these two terms, it's exactly what either Poincaré was before. If I don't have a co-cycle, I have only this part. And if I have a co-cycle, I have a third term. So this is the theorem. It, it has to be proved. It's uh, a little bit harder than uh, either Poincaré, but it's not so difficult. Okay, so let's go back to our example. Let's do barotropic fluids. In other words, the only internal energy I have admit is that depends only on density forget all the other parameters and i'm going to write it for you in three ways very carefully so i have a lagrangian that depends on parameters all the parameters are there the material density and the metric the metric why because it's the kinetic energy of what of this metric and these are the velocity vectors the material velocity vectors which are not vector fields, there are vector fields covering eta, a configuration, and the rho bar is a density in the mathematical and also physical sense. It's a measure minus the internal energy. And the internal energy depends on rho, depends on the metric, I'm sorry, it's there, and depends on the deformation, the way people say in elasticity, which for us is just the derivative, the tangent map of the configuration. In spatial representation, I have the same thing. I have the kinetic energy minus the internal energy that depends right now only on rho. The G is gone. Why? Because I'm in space and the G is not a variable anymore, it's given. If I go convective, I have also three variables. I have the velocity, I have the material density, which is constant, which is not time dependent. And I have another metric, which is C, is the pullback metric. The pullback metric is known in elasticity, it's called the cauchy green tensor. And here are the relationship between them. This rho bar is given by the usual rho. Here is the mu. Think of it as dnx, if you are in, in, in or d3x. And here are all the relationships between, between all the internal energies. It's completely explicit. Once you know one, ex, one, one of them, you know the, the other two. And here are all the formulas that link them. Okay, so now you have to write equations of motion. So you have L, you assume L is right invariant, which means that it's invariant under this action. And then the previous theorem gives you a reduction map. It tells you how the material variables relate to the spatial variables. And here they are. And you recognize them immediately. You bring the velocity to the identity and you bring the density, you make it time dependent. And, the, and it's working because the internal energy in fact turns out to be invariant. This has to be checked, but it's true. It's also left invariant under the action of the diffeomorphism of D. Here, the body and the space and everything is just a container where the fluid is. And it's invariant. And here is the action. And here you recognize the <coughs> definition of the uh, convective velocity. Okay. And the internal energy is also like this. It's, it's respecting it. This is, in fact, material frame indifference. In, in, in continuum mechanics. This is an axiom. Okay, so now you write. You can write it in spatial representation and in convective representation. 
in spatial representation, what do you get? You get the other equations for compressible fluid. Of course, P has to be given to you, and this is physics, and it's given by rho squared d d rho. Here, is it, here it is in convective representation. Look at this. This is extremely interesting. The second equation is like in relativity, is the metric that is variable, not the density. The density is constant. Here, the metric is constant and the density is a variable. Here, the density is constant and the metric is the variable. And here are given who is this divergence. It's, it's all explicitly computable. If you know, if you understand this, you know, understand perfectly well what the right hand side of this is. Let me show you how this pushes forward. <clears throat> Let me go to a case that you know very well. Let me assume ideal homogeneous incompressible fluid, classical Euler equations. So the diffeomorphism group is just volume preserving, the group of volume preserving diffeomorphisms. And I'm going to simplify my life and assume that the first cohomology is zero. You'll see that I need this. Otherwise, I have to carry uh, various circulations with me, which I don't want to do. OK, so the spatial representation is kinetic energy. And so is the convective representation. But this is the metric in space, and this is the cauchy green tensor. So now I have to compute. I know how to compute. <clears throat> In order to compute, I need to do the dual. Well, in finite dimension, the dual is given to me. In infinite dimensions, the dual is up to me. For example, I can take the L2 pairing and then declare that the dual of divergence with vector field tangent to the boundary are themselves. If you do this and you compute the Euler Poincare equations, you get, in fact, the Euler equations in the usual representation. But this is not very natural from the point of view of geometry. Duals of vector fields are not vector fields, are forms. But since this is divergence and tangent to the boundary, these are not all the forms. They are the exact one forms, which divergence, which is the co-differential is zero, which are tangent to the boundary. Well, here it, I tell you exactly who these are. You take the vector field, you lower the index, by the metric G and take D of it, where V is divergence free. Because the first cohomology is zero, this is the same as exact two forms. Okay, so therefore I should be able to write the equations as in terms of two forms. If I do this, I get the vorticity advection equation. I just proved to you something that in, in a classical fluid dynamics course for engineer takes a few weeks. The other equations are equivalent to vorticity advection, literally the same. I have a blue dual and I have a green dual. Who cares? It's the same equation. It's up to me what I want to do. So let's keep going. In convective representation, maybe I don't want to go all the way up to here. I just want to write everything in terms of forms. Yes, I can write it. Here is the Hodge projector. I drop the index by the Cauchy Green tensor this time. And here I have the Lie derivative. The, the Cauchy Green tensor is dragged along by the flow because of this equation. Now, if you actually push this forward to the extreme, what you get is that the, that the, that the omega in convective representation is zero and the metric is lead dragged by the flow. Think of the rigid body. What do we know about the rigid body? We, we write the Euler equations down, but when we want to solve the equations, what do we do? We look at the spatial angular momentum. We have the equations for the body angular momentum, but in order to solve the equation, we look for the spatial angular momentum. And what do we prove? we prove that the spatial angular momentum is conserved. That is exactly what you see here. This is the analog of the spatial angular momentum. And this is the analog of the Euler equations, pi dot equal to pi cross omega. Except this was on the, the, the group was there SO3 and it was left invariant. This is the diffeomorphist group and this right invariant, but it's completely parallel. 
absolutely parallel, line by line. And this, in fact, is a momentum map. Okay, so let me on the on the let me tell you just a very very little about the Hamiltonian side. Well, the geodesic is just t goes into eta t, and you obtain it by solving the Euler equations, and then you write the definition of the Eulerian derivative. You solve it either by solving for v or by solving for omega. And then by an elliptic equation, you solve, once you know omega, you find v. Here is the boundary condition. Now, the quadrant action turns out to be push forward. So the quadrant orbit is all the smooth rearrangements of an initial vorticity. So the quadrant action at the Lie algebra level is given by the Lie derivative. So let me give you a crash course in fluid dynamics with all the proofs that come from geometry. The vorticity is transported by the flow. Of course, I take omega zero to be omega at time t equal to zero, and I take d dt at t equal to zero of the push forward. But anybody doing manifold theory knows that this is equal to that. This is the Lie derivative formula. But this computes with pullback or push forward. So you get an equation, d dt of omega t is equal to minus lb omega t. And I just showed you that this eta t star omega solves it. Uniqueness, that's the solution. The solution curve of the vorticity advection equation remain on quadrant orbit. There is nothing to show. I just showed it. Omega is eta t star omega. That's it. How about Kelvin circulation theorem? For any loop c in d, bounding a surface, the circulation is constant, where CT is the loop pushed forward by the flow, material, the, the material part of the flow. Here is the proof completely. This is what I want to show it's constant. Okay, so I use Stokes. Okay, but d omega t is omega, change variables, but omega t star is omega, it, I'm done, it's constant. Incidentally, Poincaré knew this. He was so impressed by the Kelvin circulation theorem that he wrote a book, I don't know if you know about this. It's called Théorie de Tourbillon, in which he dedicated to the Kelvin circulation theorem. Poincaré somehow knew all this geometric picture. It's, it's very hard to believe at the end of the 19th century. Okay, liquid crystals. If you are like me, you know nothing about them, except that it's your, it's your screen. I'm going to tell Tudor. you. Yes. Tudor, I wonder if uh, anybody has uh, just a brief comment or a question to you before moving to liquid crystals. I know there is a lot of stuff you presented extremely interesting. I wonder if there are brief uh, questions or any comment from the audience. Okay, if none, then uh, please go on. Okay, so liquid crystals, I'm gonna tell you the, the history. It's actually quite interesting. It, the first guy who actually studied it was a botanist. In 1888, he accidentally discovered the strange behavior of this cholesterol benzoate that would be later called liquid crystal. He didn't understand anything. And he asked a physicist, Otto Lehmann, and Otto Lehmann is the father of the theory, and he was proposed for the Nobel Prize 10 times. He never got it, and in fact, he died. In the last time he was proposed in 22, and he died. The next step happens with a mineralogist, is Georges Friedel, who starts making a classification that we are still using today. The first serious physics going into this is due to Carlos Sen. And he wrote a thesis on the elasticity theory of liquid crystals. He, want, he deliberately used solid mechanics terminology in fluids to attract attention. And he was right because liquid crystals are exactly something in between. 
since the mid 60s, the entire uh, theoretical and experimental development is due to Gilles de Jean, who did get the, field, uh, the, the, the Nobel Prize for it. The problem is that de Jean was extremely anti mathematical. He actually gave public talks on French TV against mathematics. And you can see it in his book. His book is fantastic from the point of view of phenomenology and understanding physically. But when he starts writing equations, it's completely clear he doesn't understand anything. He writes uh, elliptic equations without boundary conditions, for example. I mean, and he keeps uh, all sorts of stuff. However, there is a very, very, very good book by Epifanio Virga, which has a third, second edition with the co-author, which I forgot, which is very mathematical. And that book really tells you a lot about certain liquid crystals. Now, I'm not going to go through all this terminology. How should you imagine it? Nematic liquid crystals are things that try to, try to have some orientation. Smectic, you have some floors, and within the floor, there is some kind of orientation. And cholesteric, it's they turn around. It's, it's like a screw. That's where it comes from. And here is how you should imagine. In solids, you have crystals. In smectic, the crystal is destroyed, but the floors on which the crystals exist is maintained. In nematic, these floors disappear, but the direction remains. And in fluids, everything has disappeared. There is no internal structure. OK, so here are pictures. I just show you pictures of them to entertain you. OK, there are main, there, are there is a lot of, to do here, an enormous, this is a completely open field. And it is absolutely amazing that uh, the demand for rigor did not come from mathematicians and physicists. It's to our shame, I must say. It came from engineers. They are all engineers. And they were asking for the mathematical and physical uh, correct theories. And nobody paid attention. Initially, it was Osen, uh, Frank, Zucker, Erickson, and Leslie. It's true that Erickson sat in the math department in Minnesota, but he, he is a, really an engineer who is very mathematical. All the people that I put here are engineers, all of them, not a single physicist or mathematician. Erringen is a civil engineer. Ray is a chemical engineer. His, his professor at McGill. Look at his papers. He's drawing bifurcation diagrams. I don't understand what he's doing. He's a remarkable guy. I talked to him. So there are various theories here that try to explain this. I'm going to show you the most complicated one, which is due to Erringen. Erringen was in the land of Yang Mills. And he was hounding mathematicians and physicists to try asking them to explain him what he's doing. Because he somehow knew he has connections, but he didn't realize this. He did. I'm going to show you what he actually did. It's actually amazing what he did. And in his book, there are only two mistakes. How he did it is beyond me. Because I can compute what he did, but I know structure. That's why I can compute. How this guy computed by hand, I have no idea. And, and he got it all correct. So there are two key assumptions. There are no more point particles. There are small deformable bodies, little jellos. These are the microfluids, liquid crystals, blood, polymer, bubbly fluids, suspensions, uh, biological fluids, all sorts of things. So you have two things. You have a material particle in a microfluid is characterized by its position. I use the same terminology and notation as before, capital X, and some vector tensor something, call it capital Xi, attached to P that denotes, in our case, for example, the orientation or the intrinsic deformation of P. Both X and Xi have their own motions. The capital one we know is the fluid. Here it is, like we do in fluids. And the Xi also has. But this guy now depends also on the fluid because it's stuck in the fluid. 
So you have a macro motion, which is the fluid motion. You have a micro motion, which is these little deformable jellos that move around. The second key assumption is that these material bodies, these little jellos, are very small. So you can live with a linear approximation. So instead of having just a general form, in fact, nobody's done it, by the way, with general. I'm having it only linearly depending on the initial condition. If this reminds you of the ellipsoidal figure of equilibrium, yes, it should, because that's exactly what you do there. And this chi of X and T is some matrix. Now, this matrix better be connected to the identity. So it's uh, in the connected component of the identity of GL3, but there could be other ones. For example, if the group is GL3, it's called micromorphic. If it's uh, this uh, group, sort of conformal rotation group, it's called microstretch. And if it's literally the SO3 group, it's called micropolar. So these are called order parameters. You can put other groups. Why not? You can do it on manifolds. Now I'm going to show you some horrible equations. This is what Erringen writes. Now Erringen, all the repeated indices are sums, regardless of whether they're up or down. It makes not for easy reading for us who are trained seriously in math or physics. Let's look at these equations. So he says, I'm going to give you the equations of motion. There are simpler ones due to Erickson and Leslie, which basically assume that the particle carries a little arrow with it. But this is in some sense too simple. Nevertheless, they are widely used because these equations, very few people know what to do with them. They are very difficult. In fact, even analytically, nothing is proved. So look here. The, the, this is something that we know. The, 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 road, the UDT, U dot grad, it's perfect. Okay, there is no minus here, but that's fine. So it's a gradient of something having to do with internal energy. That's, we recognize this. So if this guy wouldn't be here, this would be Euler, compressible Euler. Okay, there is something else here. So you look in Erringen's book and you see, and you, you start counting variables. What are the variables? Ah, mass conservation. Wonderful. He has it. He has another equation, and this was the tip of for us. I will tell you immediately. I will tell you later on what, what this equation means. It's a very interesting equation. This is the usual epsilon for the cross product. Okay, so it's here. And then you say, well, he's missing variables. I mean, for example, gamma, what do you do with this gamma? I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, it is not, it doesn't have enough equation. And then he proudly says, this is the equation. Well, an equation for me has to have a DDT. It's not a formula. So sure enough, if you look later on in the pages later, you find out that the sigma is in fact the DDT. And here it is. Sigma is in fact written like this, or even better, like this. Now, this should remind you of a rigid body. Moment of inertia, angular velocity. Okay, this is very interesting. And then he's, you still don't have all the variables. There is variables with gamma and Erringen never writes an equation for it, but he says, that if the initial condition is zero, then this equation can be in some sense solved. So this equation is what Francois Gebelma and myself have written down, that Erringen should have written down had he not assumed an initial condition is zero. Okay, so now I finally have a system. And uh, they have names. This is the Eulerian velocity, of course, it's the mass density. This is the micro rotation rate, so some angular velocity, the micro inertia tensor. This is the spin inertia. And this is a very strange variable. He calls it the Rhinus tensor. And this Rhinus tensor appears sometimes with two variables up, sometimes with one variable up. But we are educated people. We understand that SO3 is R3. So you can think of a variable in SO3 either as a matrix, in which case it has two variables, two, uh, two indices, or as a vector, in which case it has a one variable. 
right? And we know what the map is. The map is, I denote it by hat, is take the cross product. Okay, and then there is an internal energy, the free energy, which was given by Carlos Sen and others. So how do you deal with this? You have to, you have, I'm going to apply the previous theorem. However, they have internal degrees of freedom encoded in this order parameter, and there is a new equation. Let's look at this equation. This equation is attraction. This equation is attraction. This is not. Something else is going on here. So you have to deal with this. That means that you have to enlarge the particle relabeling group to the semi-direct product of the diffeomorphism group to with functions in the order parameter. These are functions from the domain into the order parameter that encode the internal structure, the internal symmetry of the fluid. And the usual advection equation for mass and the entropy on magnetic field or whatever need to be augmented by another equation, which is not advected, has to have to do with an affine representation. So let me show you what you have to do. You replace G by the semi-direct product. All the formulas can be explicitly written. Have advected variables, functions, entropy, metrics, one form. You have a representation. The, the row and the inertia tensor, this one, change as you think they change. Since this is a measure, J of eta is the Jacobian because it changes as a measure, not as a function. And this one changes as a function, except that it has also the symmetry of the group. In this case, it's SO3. And now watch this. This is actually quite remarkable. I mean, even though I knew that I never thought of it this way. You have an FI representation. You have eta. This is your group. And you have an FI representation that acts on one forms with values in SO3. By an FI representation, what do you do? You conjugate with chi, you pull back eta, and then you add a co-cycle. But for God's sake, this is a connection. I mean, we know this formula. We are teaching it to our students. In other words, the term that you add to the connection is a group one co-cycle. I mean, yes, I once I, I saw it, yes, it's true. What does this actually tell me in, in, in Riemannian geometry? <laughs> I don't know. It's very curious, but here it's crucial. This is absolutely crucial. Okay, so what do I do? I have my theorem. I don't have to think. I have to compute. This is physical exercise, not mental exercise. I just sit down and compute. Look what I get. This, these equations look awfully good. Here is my Lagrangian. Here are the, the true variables, the velocity, and the rotation in the internal variable, and all the things that are carried around by the flow. What, are, what is it? Exactly what you would expect. What could you expect? Kinetic energy of the fluid, kinetic energy of the rigid body, the little, little guy, right? Minus potential energy. And of course, physics has to tell you what psi is. And here you have to choose what kind of psi you choose, right? But once you do this, you plug it into the formulas that I gave you. Please look what I get. Look here, up to here. This is Euler. And I have another thing, a coupling term with, with, this, with this variable gamma. Let's look at the second variable. This looks up to covariant derivatives. It looks like the rigid body equation. Do you see it? But not the rigid body equation in body coordinates, in space coordinates. And if it is in space coordinates, it means that the moment of inertia has to move. Sure enough, here it is. This equation equal to zero. And this equation are the rigid body equation in spatial representation. 
literally. So here they are coupled. They are coupled with gamma in various ways. Here they are. This is a direction of mass. It's dragged along by the flow. This is dragged along by the flow. And this guy here, if it wouldn't have this variable d gamma of nu, it would say that gamma is dragged along by the flow, but it is not. Please look at this equation. It's a remarkable equation. This is a covariant derivative associated to a connection. The connection is the variable. It is time dependent. This is a very complicated equation. It tells you that it wants to be advected. It isn't because there is another variable, which is the rotation. And that one is moving according to a covariant derivative relative to the connection, which is the variable itself for which you have to solve. Gamma appears here, here, and here when you take the derivative. To be absolutely concrete, if it's SO3, this is it. It's d nu v bracket nu v gamma of v with nu. It's completely concrete. You know exactly what it is. So this, this horrible erring equations that I showed you before, all of these are literally equal to what I show you now. These equations we can understand. But look at this. Compared to Young Mills, Young Mills is playing in the sand compared to this. Young Mills doesn't have time dependent connections. This has time, the connection itself is a variable. It is absolutely astounding that this guy was running around on campus in Princeton, in the land of Yang, and nobody could tell him that he has a connection. Jerry Marsden told me that whenever he was visiting Princeton, this guy used to run after him and to ask him, what is he doing? And he, ne he never understood. And, you know, it took us a long time with uh, Gebal Ma to understand it. And when I showed it to Marsden, he said, oh, my God, I remember this guy. I never understood what he was saying. Okay. So let me see where I stand. Uh, I Now comes a colossal leap. Has to do with uh, group valued momentum maps. I want to show you something that some of you have worried about. Renzo certainly has worried about this. So here is, I'm repeating again, everything that you know. Incompressible fluids, Euler equations. I just wrote the equations once again now so that you see them. I wrote it as a form and I wrote it in terms of the quotient without assuming that it's exact one form. I'm simply repeating everything I have done before. But now I'm going to ask something else. In the rigid body equation, Remember before Poisson, nobody knew what they were. There are three equations of first order. So they can't be Hamilton because there are three. They can't be Lagrange because they're first order. So what are they? This has generated the so-called Cayley-Klein parameters. So the Cayley-Klein parameters are in fact a map from C2 to R3, which is complicated which when you pull back the Hamiltonian, which is just the kinetic energy, you get a usual Hamiltonian in C2. Now you have Hamilton's equations. You write them down. You make a computation of two pages, which I give to all my students. They have to do it to understand what is going on. And then a miracle occurs and you get other equations. Since these variables were so important, they were discovered again. And they are called Kustan Heimer Stiefel coordinates in celestial mechanics. Today they are used in quantum mechanics mostly. The Kustan Heimer Stiefel variables are identical. They are not related, they are identical. Same formula. 
with the Kelly Klein parameters. And because this is so important, it was discovered a third time. And there they're called the half vibration. The half vibration is the Kelly Klein parameters, same formula. These formulas are identical. It's not that they're related. It's literally the same formula. Today, in, Poisson, in symplectic geometry, it's nothing else but the momentum map of SU2 on C2 with values in the dual of the Lie algebra, which is R3. And of course, Hamilton's equation in C2 are sent by an equivalent momentum map, Hamilton's equation on, on the Lie algebra, dual of the Lie algebra of SO3 or SU2. This is what Kelly and Klein have done. The same thing has been done by Klebsch. So, what he wanted to have a flat space in order to write the equations. So there is a geometric construction due to Marston and Weinstein who gave some conjectures. They were cleaned out by Gebelmann and Wiesmann. This is a very interesting paper, which goes like this. Assume that you have functions from M into F and F is symplectic. And this carries a weak symplectic form. Here it is. Phi is a map, X and Y are tangent to this infinite dimensional manifold. So what are they? They are maps from M to TF covering Phi. And the natural action by precomposition of the usual particle relieving group preserves omega. Therefore, we should have momentum maps. Omega, if omega is d theta, this action admits an equivalent momentum map. And there it is, it's written explicitly down. And in fact, it can be generalized. Now, equivalent momentum maps are Poisson. So J map solution of Hamilton's, the Hamiltonian system here to solution of the other equations. In fact, J is the Klebsch variables. It is the momentum map. However, if it's R2, then you get the standard Klebsch variables as you find it in Klebsch's paper. Literally the same formula. Okay. But the Klebsch variables have a problem. The problem is that the helicity is zero. Here is the proof. The helicity of V is V flat wedge dV flat. I plug in the Klebsch variables. Here it is. This is the full computation. I write it out. I literally write it out. There are two terms, as you can see. Here is a three formula, two manifold. It's zero. And this has no boundary. So Stokes kills it. So helicity is conserved. We know that. However, there are not, and there the helicity is not zero. Situation is getting worse. And Ciso Peralta Salas proved in 2012 that any knot, any vorticity knot is achievable in R3. Now you can argue this is not physical, this is in R3, but nevertheless, you can't ignore it. So now I'm going to make a colossal leap. And the leap is that I'm going to generalize this. I'm going to get to Klebsch variables, which admit helicity that is integer valued. So there is a group valued momentum map in a very interesting object. These are called uh, differential characters, Chiger Simons differential characters. I have to tell you what they are. So these are gauge equivalence classes of circle bundles with connection. This is an abelian group. So you have circle bundles and you have a connection. You have a pre-quantum bundle. So this was already known to Kobayashi long time ago that it's an abelian group. Of course, it can be generalized to any k. But I'm going to, to tell you what this is. If I give you two principal bundles, circle bundles, you form their fiber product, step one. You let the circle act on the first one the usual way, on the second one by the inverse action, and take the quotient. You get a new principal U1 bundle. Here it is, where the U1 action is a translation only on the first factor. This turns out to be associative and commutative. The trivial bundle is the identity, is the, the, is the identity element, and the inverse is the same bundle with the opposite action. Okay, now I need connections. I take a connection A on P and A tilde on P tilde. I pull them back to the fiber product. And then I descend to the quotient. I denote this as A plus A tilde. And the curvature is the sum of these two. 
a lot of things have to be proved. It turns out this is an abelian Fréchelin group. The Lie algebra is exactly the space where the Euler equations take place. Exactly. So you have a map, and here is the Chern class from this one, and you get a Klebsch presentation explicitly. We accept that this new now is a closed form with integer periods, integral periods, closed k form. This is a two form in this case, closed two form with integral periods. So in this case, the Euler equations descend and you can get Klebsch variables with integral helicity. Let me stop here, I already went overboard. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I have to say that has been a fantastic uh, uh, first part a review of work and uh, uh, presentation of uh, these fundamental geometric character of hydrodynamics and the second part also extremely interesting. So I should invite uh, people to, um, to, uh, to put questions to Tudor. I know we have a rather diversified audience. Uh, I wonder if uh, um, Randy Kamian maybe wants to say something. Sure. Maybe others. I should tell you, I mean, one of the questions that I would have expected is from where did these differential characters come from? Did, did I think about fluids? No, the answer is no. Uh, it was a shock when fluids came in. What I really wanted to understand is a problem that I worked in 1986 with Marsden and Tromba. I wanted to show that the Teichmuller space is a reduced phase space. If you look at the Teichmuller space, uh, it is uh, a quotient. Curvature, constant curvature over I, diffeomorphism isotopic to the identity. Formally, this is like J minus one mu over G mu. And since Atia Bot told us that the curvature is a momentum map, this carries water. We couldn't do it. <laughs> so uh, uh, we, we really worked very hard for a whole day. And after a whole, whole day, we drew a blank. We, I mean, it was one of those days in which you, at the end of the day, you literally have no idea. We didn't know what to read, what to try, nothing worked. <laughs> so I, I came back with this with my collaborator, young collaborator, Tobias Dietz, who was working on infinite dimensions on young Mills and so on. So I said, why don't we think about this? I mean, you know, may, maybe, maybe we see something. So sure enough, we saw, he started to compute and there was always an obstruction. And when he showed me the obstruction, I recognized it. It was a formula that generalized the momentum for Poisson Lie groups. And then we of course solved our problems. But once we saw this, then suddenly we realized this applies to many other things. Fluid dynamics is one of them. Lagrangian embeddings is another one. Young Mills is another one. Sure. So, so, so this momentum group valued momentum maps with values in differential characters appears everywhere. In fact, this answers questions posed by Donaldson. Donaldson tried to compute the momentum map <clears throat> for gauge groups and symplectomorphous group, and he couldn't. Why couldn't he? Because he found obstructions, and there are real obstructions. You can't go away. The obstructions are there. Mm -hmm. Period. You, you cannot do it. It's over. Well, we took the attitude if you can join, if you can't beat them, you join them. So the obstructions are now part of our momentum map. So our momentum map is now capable of encoding topological information. Yeah, sure. Which a classical momentum map cannot. Classical momentum map is just the values in the dual of the Lie algebra. But we know that there is topological information that the momentum map doesn't see. For example, 
the law of conservation of isotropy, if you have symmetry. But that we understand by a singular reduction. That no, it's okay. But here you have churn classes. Where are they? So the, the obstructions that uh, Donaldson found can be found from our momentum map once we apply churn classes to them and various operations on these differential characters will recover them, all of them. Wonderful. I think I think is also a matter of uh, linking this uh, new approach to all these uh, new breath of uh, condensates and uh, uh, fluids, so to speak, with spin. And uh, so it's a great, great promise for for future developments. It's amazing. It's the right time too. So <laughs> yes, there are liquid crystals are just some of them. There are many other complex. Sure, sure exactly. Well, thank you very much, Tudor. Uh, has has been wonderful. And uh, thank you very I think, much. Uh, I think we should we should stop here. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.